Hello, and welcome to Campfire Stories. Tonight, I will be your host and guide to the many hauntings from around the world. And tonight, I'm going to take you to Canada, where I'm going to be talking about stories about the Wendigo. Phantom of the Forest. So, let's get comfortable. Warm yourself up to the fire. Toast some marshmallow, marshmallows. And cuddle up close to whoever's nearby. And let's start. Shall we? The Wendigo is a dark and terrifying entity rooted in the earliest legends of the native the natives of Canada. This fearful spirit looms large in the lives of the Algonquin people, which includes Ojibwa, Cree, and Blackfoot nations. These nations now live on reservations in the Northwest Territories, Ontario, Territories, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and other re and the outer regions of Quebec. The formless and vengeful spirit of the Wendigo is stuff of nightmares. It lurks within the deepest, darkest forest, silently hovering and watching its phantom of hunger, hunting out lonely wanderers to attack and possess. No other spirit, no other evil spirit has ever evoked such terror in the people. The Wendigo is a ghost of winter, howling in its bitter wind and turning the hearts of victims into blocks of ice. The legend, the legend states that during the harsh winters, when food was scarce and the, and the spirit of the Wendigo would enter a person, causing them to become violent and antisocial, with a taste for human flesh. The only way to get rid of the mel malevolent spirit would to be would to set fire to the body of its host. The Wendigo can fly throughout the forest and melt into winds, moving faster than the human eye can follow. It is possessed of a supernatural strength and can kill a person with a single glare. You would be forgiving for assuming that the Wendigo is a phantom grown from seeds of imagination and folkloric tale passed from generations to generations, or a story told by native medicine men in their winter camp camps to fill the minds of empty-bellied children. It, it is a st story rooted in the fact with numerous historical accounts documenting the trials of the Wendigo possessed people. The earliest of these accounts dates back to the 1700s when, when an explorer named David Thompson witnessed such a, a trial while traveling through the lakes of the wooding re, wood regions. A young Native American, Native, a young Indian Native hunter had been taken over by the spirit of a Wendigo and was battling with a desire to eat his own sister. A decision was taken by the tribal council. The young hunter was first strangled by his father, then thrown onto a huge fire where his body was burnt to ashes. Not a single bone was left remaining, ensuring that the evil spirits could not return to the world of mankind. Many reports of the Wendigo came from hard-headed frontiersmen who were not given to superstition. 
Their lives were far too difficult and rooted and practical concerns to spare a thought for a supernatural imaginings. One of the best documented cases of a Wendigo haunting took place in the Five Lakes region in northeastern Alberta. In 1746, a group of sailors staked claim to various plots of land close to an al already established but secretive camp. The people of this camp indulged in weird ritualistic ceremonies and wild rumors circulated above about them. Not long after establishing, establishing their homes, the body of one of the new farmers was found butchered and partially eaten by the apparent victim of a grisly bear attack. Three men were dispatched to hunt down the bear and headed into the forest near the mysterious camp. They never returned, and the suspicious suspicion grew that the strange going on going on within the nearby camp were to blame for the death of the farmer and the missing hunters. The settlers' anger grew, and they eventually approached William Blake the leader of the camp, to determine that he and his followers leave the area. Their demand was refused, so they surround the camp and sealed it off, ensuring the livestock and crops could not be tended. After a particularly long and bitter winter, the settlers broke into the camp and found the entire community, including, including William Blake, dead. The bodies with limbs ripped off and particularly eaten were strewn about the place. An, egg, an orgy of cannibalism had obviously taken place, and women and children had been devoured in a frenzied banquet. The settlers tortured the camp, torched the camp in an attempt to erase the horror from their minds, and William Blake and his community were never spoken of again. The years passed, and centuries later, the town of Fort Kent was built on the fertile land where the old settlers had once lived. An English doctor named Thomas Burton moved to the town with his wife, Katie, and soon established a successful medical practice. At first, the town and its people seemed to flourish, but the winter of 1920, the dreams and happiness of the townspeople were in, irrevocably shattered. A great plague of rats invaded the town and many people were struck down with a deadly and mysterious illness. The winter was the longest and coldest ever recorded with families trapped, dying alone in their homes and their livestock perished and the killer of snows. Thomas Burton did all he could for his patients, but when his own wife fatally succumbed to the disease, he gave up all hope and barricaded himself in his house. After a few months, he reappeared in the community and completely changed man. He was a wild and uncapped, a shadow of his former self. He would stalk the streets at night hiding in the shadows, and the most chillingly of all, he insisted he was now called William Blake, a name which had not been uttered in the area for over a hundred years, and which he certainly would never have heard. On a flat and lifeless fall evening in October 1921, the possessed body of Thomas Burton systematically broke into every house in town and slaughtered and ate parts of all but 11 residents. Had the once hard-working doctor been invaded by the spirit of a 100-year-old Wendigo? The Royal Canadian Mounted Police attempted to suppress the news. Such 
was a terror it evoked. Thomas Burton was ex executed for his crimes, but his body was never burned. Does this mean that the vile and savage deeming of the forest has been left to wander, searching for its next victim? The, native in, na the natives of Canada certainly believe so, and the cursed spirit of the Wendigo continues to ba do battle with the suffering souls of men. And last but not least, the haunted hotel of Banff, Canada. The Banff Springs Hotel lies in the heart of the Rocky Mountains in Western Canada. It is one of the most luxurious hotels in the world and is prized not only for its service and amenities, but for its breathtaking location. It's surrounded by majestic mountains, scenic rivers, lakes, and wonderfully therapeutic hot springs. The hotel was constructed in 1888 by the Canadian Pacific Railroad as it carved its way through the wilderness of the mountains. The potential of the location was noted by William Van Horn, Vice President of the CPR, and the ordered the building of the sumptuous 250 room hotel. Despite its obvious attract attractiveness, the hotel hides some dark and ghoulish secrets within this vast and lavish interior. During the construction of the building, workmen mistakenly created a room with neither doors nor windows. Working within a tight schedule and even tight, tighter budget, they decided the safest course of action would to hide their blunder and confess to no one. So the Banner Springs was completed with only the workmen aware of the existence of the extra room. The hotel proved incredibly popular, attracting visitors from all over the world. But it wasn't long before guests reported seeing strange and shadowy apparitions drifting down to the corridor boarding, bordering the hidden room. A mist would appear in the surrounding rooms and the phantom bellhop would materialize and ask the terrified guest in a disturbingly hoarse whisper whether he could fetch them anything. A fire broke out in the hotel in 1926 and it was the only that the hidden room was discovered. It was of course completely empty and had been inaccessible, but the hotel management was convinced that the, ex the existence of somehow responsible for the unnerving phenomena that it had been occurring in the injuncting corridor. corridor. They surmised that the room had been empty. The lost spirits of workmen who had died during the hotel's construction had decided to take up residence. The hotel was rebuilt in 1928 and became known as the Castle of, Ro of the Rockies. The removal of the hidden room did indeed dispel the shadow of the workmen, but the ghoulish bellhop continues in his duties. He is a consensuous worker and he has even been known to open doors for guests who had forgotten their keys. He is now affectionately known as Sam. There is a place within the hotel which holds an even darker mystery. Room 8, 873 does not appear on the hotel registry, and the employees are forbidden to talk of it. It's a doorway that has been walled up. Although you can still see the space where it used to be, it is rumored that the family was murdered in this room, and the hideous cries of their pain and terror petrified all subsequent residents. Hotel cleaners refused to enter the room after trying out after trying on numerous occasions to remove child-sized fingerprints from the mirrors. 
no matter how hard they polished, the tiny prints would appear again and again. Room 873 was sealed, and the hotel once again harbored a hidden room. Stand the bellhop is not the only spirit to wander the plushly carpeted and expansively scented rooms of the Bed of Spring Hotel. He has been joined by a vision of a woman in, in a white wedding dress with a hideously disfigured face. She is seen by visitors descending the central staircase and is thought to be the ghost of a bride whose wedding took place at the hotel. She had a staircase filled with hundreds of lighted candles, so her entire so her interest, entrance into the reception would be wonderfully romantic. However, the heavy lace of her dress caught on the candle and she entered the, the reception in a fireball. For all its murky mysteries, the Castle of the Rockies is a truly awesome building in a spectacular location where you can be sure of the warmest welcome, especially from the ever attentive Sam. I'm going to end with the story from Scary Stories 3, More Tales to Chill Your Bones by Alvin Schwartz. When death arrives, when death arrives, it's, it is usually the end of the story, but in these stories, it's only the beginning. A 16-year-old boy worked on his grandfather's horse farm. One morning, he drove a pickup truck into, the, into town on an errand. While he was walking along the main street, he saw death. Death beckoned to him. The boy drove back to the farm as fast as he could and told his grandfather what had happened. Give me the truck, he begged. I'll go to the city. He'll never find me there. His grandfather gave him the truck and the boy sped away. After he left, his grandfather went into town looking for death. When he found him, he asked, why did you find my grandson away? He's only 16. He's too young to die. I am sorry about that, said Death. I did not mean to beckon to him, but I was surprised to see him here. You see, I have an appointment with him this afternoon in the city. The bus stop. Ed Cox was driving home from work in the rainstorm. While he waited for a traffic light to change, he saw a young woman standing alone at the bus stop. She had no umbrella and she was soaking wet. Are you going toward Farmington, he called? Yes, I am, she said. Would you like a ride home? I would, she said, and she got in. My name is Joanna, Benny. Thank you for rescuing me. I'm Ed Cox, he said, and you are welcome. On the way, they talked and talked. She told him about her family and her job and where she had gone to school and he told her about himself. By the time they got to her house, the rain had stopped. I'm glad it rained, Ed said. Would you like to go out tomorrow after work? I'd love to, Joanna said. She asked him to meet her at the bus stop, since it was her near her office. They had such a good time, they went out many times after that. Always they would meet at the bus stop, and off they would go. Ed liked her more and more each time he saw her, but one night, when they had a date to go out, Joanna did not appear. Ed waited at the bus stop for almost an hour. Maybe something is wrong, he thought. He drove to her house in Farmington. The older woman came to the door. I'm Ed Cox, he said. Maybe Joanna told you about me? I had a date with her tonight. We were supposed to meet at the bus stop near the, her office. But she didn't show up. Is she all right? The woman looked at him as if she had, if he had said something strange. 
I am Joanna's mother, she, s she said slowly. Joanna isn't here now, but why don't you come in? Ed pointed to a picture on the mantel. That looks just like her, he said. It did once, her mother replied. But that pictures were taken when she was your age, about 20 years ago. A few days later, she was waiting in the rain at the bus stop. A car hit her, and she was killed. Faster and faster. Sam and his cousin Bob went walking in the woods. The only sounds were leaves rustling and now and now and again. A bird chirping. It was so it's so quiet here, Bob was it's so quiet here, Bob whispered. But that soon changed after a few minutes the two boys started whooping and howling howling hollering and chasing one another around. Sam ducked behind the tree. When Bob came by, Sam jumped out at him. Then Bob raised ahead and hid behind the bush. When he looked down, when he looked down, there at his feet was an old drum. Sam, see what I found, he called. It looks like a tom-tom. I bet it's a hundred years old. Look at the red stains on it, said Sam. I bet it's somebody's blood. Let's get out of here. But Bob could not resist trying the drum. He sat on the ground and he held it between his legs. He beat on it with one hand, then another, slowly at first, then faster and faster, almost as if he could not stop. Suddenly, there were shouts in the woods and the sound of the hoofbeats. A cloud of dust rose from behind the line, line of a tree. The men on horseback galloped toward them. Bob, let's go, Sam shouted. He began to run. Hurry! Bob dropped the drum and ran after him. Sam heard the twang of a bow firing an arrow. Then he heard Bob scream. When Sam turned, he saw Bob pitch forward dead. But there was no arrow in his body, and there was no wound. When the police searched there, there were no men on horseback, and there were no hoof prints, and there was no drum. The only sounds were leaves rustling now and rustling and now and again, a bird chirping. My cat's eyes. As Jim Brand lay dying, his wife left him with his nurse and went into the next room to rest. She sat in the dark, staring into the night. Suddenly, Mrs. Brand saw headlights coming rapidly up the driveway. Oh no, she thought. I don't want visitors right now. Visitors now. Not now. But it wasn't a car bringing a visitor. It was an old hearse with maybe a half a dozen small men hanging from the sides. At least, that's what it looked like. The hearse screeched to a stop. The men jumped off and stared up at her, their eyes glowing with a soft yellow light. Yellow light, like cat's eyes. She watched with horror as they disappeared into the house. The instant later, they were back, lifting something into the hearse. Then they drove off at high speed, wheels squealing, the gravel in the driveway flying in all directions. And that moment, the nurse came in to say that Jim Brand had died. Harold. When it got when it got hot in the valley, 
Thomas Alfred drove their cows up to the cool green pasture in the mountains to graze. And usually, usually they stayed with their cows for two months. Then they would, then they brought them down to the valley again. The work was easy enough, but oh, it was boring. All day the two men tended their cows. At night they went back into the tiny hut where they lived. They ate supper and worked in the garden and went to sleep. It was always the same. Then Thomas had an idea that changed everything. Let's make a doll the size of a man, he said. It would be fun to make and we could paint, put it in the garden to scare away the birds. It should look like Harold, Alfred said. Harold was a farmer they both hated. They made the doll out of old sacks of stuffed with straw. They gave a pointy nose like Harold's and eyes like his. Then they added dark hair and, twi and a twisted frown. Of course, they also gave Harold's name. Each morning on their way to the pasture, they tied Harold to a pole in the garden to scare away the birds. Each night, they brought him inside so that he wouldn't get ruined if it rained. When they were feeling playful, they would talk to him. One of them might say, How are the vegetables growing today, Harold? Then the other, making believe he was Harold, would answer in a crazy voice, very slowly. They both would laugh, but not Harold. Whenever something went wrong, they took it out on Harold. They would curse at him, even kick him in the, or punch him. Sometimes one of them would take the food they were eating, which they both were sick of, and smear it on the doll's face. How do you like that stew, Harold? He would ask. Well, you better eat it or else. Then the two men would howl with laughter. One night, after Thomas had wiped Harold's face with food, Harold grunted. Did you hear that? Alfred asked. It was Harold, Thomas said. I was watching him when it happened. I can't believe it. How could he grunt? Alfred asked. He's just a sack of straw. It's not possible. Let's throw him in the fire, said Thomas. And that will be that. Let's not do anything stupid. Alfred said Alfred. We don't know what's going on. When we move the cows down, we'll, we'll leave him behind. For now, let's just keep an eye on him. So they left Harold sitting in a corner of the, hu of the hut. They didn't talk to him or take him outside anymore. Now and then the dog grunted. But, it w but that was all. After a few days, they decided there was nothing to be afraid of. Maybe a mouse or some insects had gotten inside Harold and were making those sounds. So Thomas and Alfred went back to their old ways. Each morning they put Harold out in the garden and each night they brought him in into the hut. When they felt playful, they joked with him. When they felt mean, they treated him as badly as ever. Then one night Alfred noticed something that frightened him. Harold is growing. He said, I was thinking the same thing, Thomas said. Maybe it's just our imaginations, Alfred replied. We have been up here on this mountain too long. The next morning, while they were eating, Harold stood up and walked out of the hut. He climbed up on the roof and trotted back and forth like a horse on his, on its hind leg, legs. All day and all night, he trotted like that. In the morning, Harold climbed down and stood in the far corner of the pasture. The men had no idea what he would do next. They were afraid. They decided to take the cows down into the valley that same day. When they left, Harold was nowhere in sight. They felt as if they had escaped a great danger and began joking and singing. But when they had gone only a mile or two, they realized they had forgotten to bring the milk the milking stools. Neither of them wanted to go back for them, but the stools would cost a lot to replace. There's really nothing to be afraid of, they told each other. After all, 
what could a doll do? They drew straws to see which one would go back. It was Thomas. I'll catch up with you, he said, he asked Alfred. He said to Alfred, Alfred walked on towards the valley. When Alfred came to the to a rise path, rise in the path, he looked back for Thomas. He did not see him anywhere, but he did see Harold. The doll was on the roof of the hut again. As Alfred watched, Harold kneeled and stretched out a bloody skin to dry in the sun. And I'll leave you with that. Good night. Sleep tight. And don't let anything come crawling. Good night.